joined by the city's director of homeless policy and outreach, Andrew Johnston, the state's homeless services coordinator, Wayne Niederhauser, thank you, as well as our partners with the Salt Lake Valley Coalition to End Homelessness, including Lori Hopkins, thank you for being here today. And thank you all for your service and your continued acknowledgement that this is a statewide crisis, not just a crisis in Salt Lake City. I'm gonna make several significant announcements today, but about the next phase in the city's homelessness strategy. But first I wanna reiterate the values that have and will continue to govern Salt Lake City's response to this decades long crisis. As a city, we're committed to treating all people with respect, including those residents experiencing homelessness, our housed residents, business owners and visitors. We're committed to maintaining public spaces that are safe clean and accessible to all, and to using law enforcement intervention only when criminal activity needs to be addressed. Salt Lake City residents are only 17% of the total population in Salt Lake County, yet we currently invest more than $15 million each year to support direct services to the unsheltered. Of the 1,500 emergency beds available in Salt Lake County as a whole through the winter of 2020-21, 853 of those were located in Salt Lake City. We've hosted emergency shelters here in the city over the last two winters, and for the last 10 months, we've mobilized an exhaustive effort with more than a dozen organizations to bring services to our unsheltered neighbors where they're at on the street to try to help them get the support they deserve and the housing they need. Our commitment to and support for people experiencing house homelessness is undeniable. Despite these efforts, the homeless services system remains unable to ensure that any person who needs it has a safe, sheltered space to sleep at night and access to the services they need to help them get back on their feet. This reality isn't acceptable. With the pandemic forcing more of our neighbors out of their homes, with neighboring cities enforcing zero tolerance policies for unsheltered homelessness, and with a nexus of services for homeless individuals located here in our capital city, our homeless resource centers have been operating near or at capacity and too many people literally have nowhere to go. The growth of the unsheltered population living on Salt Lake City streets has been accompanied by a larger and larger encampment situation in public spaces and unfortunately criminal activity in and around those encampments. This can't be tolerated either. Every resident of the city deserves to feel safe here, whether they are sheltered or not. People shouldn't be afraid to bring their kids down to Liberty Park or walk to a store or a restaurant in downtown or walk down the sidewalk in Rio Grande or along the Jordan River. Over the past year, we have radically transformed the former status quo by meeting people where they're at, out on the street, but it still hasn't been enough. We must do more and we need solutions to both of these challenges, homelessness and crime, and the places where they intersect. We're gonna work these problems together in parallel and in partnership, but we cannot and we will not do it alone as a city. As you know, I launched the Community Commitment Program last fall, partnering with more than a dozen service agencies and our county partners to provide resources and bring services directly to the city's unsheltered residents rather than hoping they come into us. The good news is that because of those efforts, in the past nine months, we've connected over 160 individuals to shelter or detox, and we've engaged with individuals thousands of times. The bad news is that the overwhelming majority of those we attempt to help decline our assistance and they do so for a variety of reasons, but the end outcome is the same, and we have to live in that reality. We have to address that reality. We can't make good policy if we ignore this. The program's outreach-focused work has also made it clear that there were specific areas within our city that are particularly vulnerable to the establishment of entrenched encampments and the criminal activity that can occur in and around them. These issues stymie our goal of keeping our public spaces safe, clean, and accessible to all. So it was becoming clear in the spring earlier this year that our strategy was going to have to adapt further. At around the same time we brought in Andrew Johnston to run homelessness policy for our city, 
And around that time, Governor Cox appointed Wayne Niederhauser to coordinate it for the state. President Biden had also just signed the American Rescue Plan into law. The intersection of events seemed to prevent an opportunity for both short-term and, finally, long-term changes to the city's and the state's homeless strategy. If there were ever a time for a big change, this is it. It was also around this time that you might recall me creating a bit of controversy by saying that the state needed additional beds to shelter the growing homeless population. The data and our experience with the Community Commitment Program all strongly pointed to that need. Earlier this week, the Salt Lake Valley Coalition to End Homelessness announced that there is an immediate need for at least 300 additional emergency shelter beds in the system. That's what service providers say is needed to ensure that no one who wants a bed inside will be forced to camp outside. The city agrees with that conclusion, and I'm here today to ask that the state support the coalition and its partners to do whatever it takes to get those beds online quickly before winter, and that the beds be located not only in Salt Lake City, but also in other parts of Salt Lake County. It's my hope that any Utah who wants a warm, safe place to sleep at night has that option by December 1st. We can't go another year, let alone another winter, without the space to shelter Utahns who are out on the street right now. Meeting that 300 bed goal is important for another reason. Without those beds being available, Salt Lake City cannot begin to consistently enforce its camping ordinance and will continue to struggle to deal more directly with the very real issue we have of criminals attempting to exploit and prey upon homeless encampments. We'll also continue to be unable to meet our goal of ensuring that public spaces stay clean, safe, and accessible to everyone. It has been illegal to camp in Salt Lake City in one form or another since 1965. And the City Council updated and affirmed this ordinance recently in 2012. But without guaranteed shelter space, it is legally and morally difficult to have sustained citywide enforcement of this ordinance unless other criminal activity is also occurring. It cannot and it will not be against the law to be homeless in Salt Lake City. That will not change for as long as I am the mayor. But the way in which some people are camping in our public spaces is against the law, and in some cases affecting public safety directly. And so what must change is the ability to enforce the city's camping ordinance. Last week, Salt Lake City adjusted this approach by beginning prioritized, ongoing camp enforcement targeted around vulnerable areas and populations. By putting more law enforcement resources into keeping areas clear that are especially susceptible to re-establishment of large encampments and accompanying criminal activity, our goal is to shift the culture in these areas. Entrenched camping and crime will no longer be an attractive and an easy option. Outreach efforts to camps will continue. Offers of warm, safe beds and shelters will continue to be made and individuals will be given the chance to vacate these areas voluntarily. And they will only be cited if they refuse to comply with the law. We will ask that the state support our law enforcement efforts by increasing the mitigation fund for communities that host homeless resource centers. We will also propose that the state participate in the funding of the Downtown Ambassador Program, which has been a successful addition in our city's downtown and North Temple districts. And if the state, the county, and the coalition can coordinate to meet the goal of 300 safe, warm beds available for every unsheltered resident, the city will be able to begin more widespread, consistent enforcement of its camping ordinance. That's our commitment, but our commitment depends on our partners in this system to fulfill their roles too. Looking out at the long term, we know that enforcement and shelter are not the only needed solution. I can't reiterate enough that having shelter space to bring people off the street is really the, just the middle part of the work that has to be done. The ultimate goal is to provide everyone the opportunity for permanent housing, for supportive services that are needed to maintain people's health and housing, and a community that embraces them as equals. 
I'm happy to announce today that I will propose to the Salt Lake City Council the use of funds made available through President Biden's American Rescue Plan legislation to invest in the creation of more permanent supportive housing options here in Salt Lake City. This kind of housing is transformative. Residents of these buildings live immersed in services, in community, and in training to help them in their transition out of chronic homelessness or emergency shelter living. Just last month, we saw the ribbon cutting of the shelter of the homeless in the road home's new 65 unit Magnolia apartment building downtown. And as you saw last week, the Other Side Academy is moving forward with its planned tiny home village here in Salt Lake City. We're fortunate to have this opportunity to further expand the city's inventory of permanent supportive housing, and I'm committed to using our ARPA dollars to help change lives. Utah's homelessness crisis is deeply rooted in the lack of affordable housing, inadequate access to mental health and substance abuse treatment, low wages that haven't kept pace with housing prices, and multi-generational poverty, among other far-reaching and systemic issues. But without access to mental health and substance abuse treatment, as well as deeply affordable and permanent supportive housing, we will be right back here next year. We're ask we'd be asking again to expand our emergency shelter beds. Let's get real about the fact that as our state's population grows, so too does the proportion of those experiencing homelessness. And it doesn't have to be this way. While we have great hope for the services that will be provided by the Crisis Care Center at the Huntsman Mental Health Institute when it opens in 2023, there remains an acute need each and every day on the streets of our capital city. The gap between now and more permanent solutions ahead of us needs to be bridged. And today, I'm asking our county and state partners to prioritize funding that would temporarily open a bridge receiving center for behavioral health services and substance abuse detox and treatment. I know that we all agree this is a critical piece of the solution, but we simply cannot wait two more years for it to get here. Today, we see a reality that has been decades long in the making. And to date, too many strategies have temporarily masked this statewide humanitarian crisis rather than addressing it with lasting solutions. The statewide system needs more support. It needs more participation. No single entity can handle the state's homeless population without a whole system approach. I know I've covered a lot of ground here, so I just want to reiterate that there's uh, six key components. Salt Lake City is beginning prioritized enforcement of its camping ordinance focused on the most entrenched and problematic locations. Outreach to these locations will continue to occur. Individuals will be given every chance to move on, will be offered shelter as, as we can, and with, will only be cited if they refuse. If the 300 bed goal can be achieved, as we ask those partners to do by December 1st, the city will be able to begin a consistent enforcement of its camping ordinance. We also ask that those new beds be located not only in Salt Lake City, but throughout Salt Lake County. Third, the city will ask the state to provide ongoing funding to the downtown ambassadors for homeless outreach and business assistance, as well as ensure that cities, that all cities with that host homeless resource centers receive dependable, adequate mitigation funding for public safety. Fifth, I'll propose using some of the city's American Rescue Plan dollars to invest in new permanent supportive housing here. And finally, I'm asking that the Salt Lake County Council and state legislature prioritize funding for a temporary receiving center for behavioral health services and substance abuse detox and services. For the sake of every individual who finds themselves facing homelessness, with needs as unique as the next person, we must not only do better than we have, but move forward with a bold intent and a rock solid commitment to doing what must be done throughout these systems and these levels of government, no matter how complicated they seem. We're gonna set our state and our people on a better course. And we have the ability to do it, to set individuals and couples and families up for success and security and not perpetual cycle of instability. We, as a city, are confident in the data by the Coalition to End Homelessness that's informed the 300-bed need. And we're confident in the work of Wayne Niederhauser's office that has resulted in the clear call to action 
for 3,000 affordable front doors in our county this year and 1,400 new front doors every year after. We're undaunted by this data because I know that collectively we are capable. Financially, as a state, we are capable. And politically, I believe we're capable of doing what's right for the entire state. Salt Lake City is ready to chart this new course with our county and our state partners, with service providers, and with the communities of residents housed and unhoused who call this great state home. Thanks for being here today, uh, and we'd be happy to answer questions. Uh, no, I think that the, and I'll let Andrew speak to this as he's been working on the prioritized approach and the phases thereafter. Um, but, well, Andrew, do you want to take it from prioritized to? <laughs> I guess my larger question the is what happens to the people that are, if there are still people on the street that maybe that kind of Sure. I think it's hard to say at this point because there's so many different folks out there. Uh, if we have three to 500 people out there, there's, that many different stories and particular needs. Uh, what we're trying to figure out is how many of those folks need uh, individual rooms, motels, hotels, uh, that action immediately. Last winter was pretty clear that a large, large percentage of them would immediately go in if it was available. Um, so we're confident in that piece. We are gonna have a, a number of folks who aren't gonna fit whatever housing we have options, and that's where we need to tailor our outreach efforts to them specifically and figure out exactly what's going on in their lives um, and their experiences to help them get the right fit. Um, that's gonna be very personalized at that level. In what way is it gonna be personalized? I mean, if, if there's law enforcement that shows up to an encampment, what happens? Well, the first thing is we need outreach first there, and we've done that for a number of years. We need to know who they are, their experiences, because when you first talk to somebody, they may not tell you the whole story. Um, over multiple interactions, we get more information and figure out they're not telling us this piece about their experience, which makes it hard to go into this type of housing or shelter, particularly with mental illness. Um, we may not have the full story. We've got to figure out how to tailor that intervention to them. Um, and at that point, we can figure out what's the best fit for them. So it's hard to say right now. I think we want to take the first approach of helping everyone live up to the expectation of the ordinance um, is the goal. And at that point, then we can figure out the right housing option for everybody. You mentioned that done the outreach and a lot of them, I think it was the majority of people are basically shelter resistant. They, they don't, they, they decline the offer that you have. So if you have 300 additional beds, how, how do you convince the people who are maybe shelter resistant to go if they already are declining uh, what you're offering now? That's a good question about how do you help folks who are saying they don't want the help they're offering. I think there's two pieces to that. One is, are we offering the right support and assistance? Do we know exactly what's going on with them that makes them unwilling or unable to go into whatever we have option? That's a learning process for us. We've done that over a number of years. Last year was very informative in that when we had non-congregate setting and motel rooms, we filled those up within days. Um, that's hundreds of rooms. So we know that is something that is very attractive to a lot of folks, particularly couples and folks with things and pets. We also know that there's also a lot of trauma involved in, in folks' lives, and we don't always know the effect that has on their perception of what they want. Sometimes it's hard to be in close settings. We know that. Sometimes it's hard to be in the right place in the right neighborhood. We know that as well. It's going to take some time to figure this out, but the first step is get enough beds so we can get the option available to folks and continue with the outreach, continue with the personalized by name list we've got to figure out what's going to work for every single person. No, absolutely not, and there's a reason for that that I talked about a moment ago. We have a confluence of change happening right now, uh, basically since the month of May. We have data coming from the coalition that gives us a very clear number of how many beds would need to be available in order for us to actually be able to uh, genuinely offer anyone who's camping in Salt Lake County a place to sleep at night. Um, that's new information for us. 
the creation of the office that Wayne Niederhauser holds now in the Governor's Office of Management and Budget gives us a far more coordinated statewide and hopefully more localized um, collaboration on how we go about fulfilling these needs. And as I said at the beginning, Salt Lake City has, we have legal duties, we have duties to our public, and we have moral duties as a government organization. For us to be enforcing when there are not beds available um, in a blanket consistent format across the city isn't the right thing for us to do. It wasn't the right, right thing for us to do. And that's why we're calling for these beds to be created so that we can um, do consistent enforcement across the city. And a, to, a little bit to a question earlier, what we're focusing on here, especially with this prioritized approach that we just be, we have just begun, is, um, is, is looking at the encampments that are having an impact on the quality of life, the public safety of the people who are living in them, and the community surrounding them, and the criminal activity that's taking place there. So the, the ability for us to truly offer people appropriate shelter beds, detox beds, um, we can't make them say yes to those beds, but when it comes to impacting our public spaces, we do have a law that's been on the books for decades, and this will help us to be able to enforce it. You see Rio Grande has been enforced now. There are very few people there. Mm -hmm. I know businesses there complain for months. Again, do you think something should have been done there earlier? We have cleared Rio Grande five times, and, and Rio Grande is one of those that keeps reestablishing. And we know from in the last 18 months, and. Um, sometime before that, that a, a police presence in an area can help to deter re-establishment of those areas that are really predisposed to re-entrenchment of camps. So that presence is really critical, and our police ability to do that, um, that, if that regular presence and enforcement is an important part. Uh, I'd have, you can ask Chief Brown about what that strategy is. I'm not directing uh, the police operations on that. Yeah. You know, obviously, I wasn't the mayor then. When um, when the previous road home facility was open on Rio Grande, there wasn't a hard cap to the number of beds, and and we all know that they would get up over a thousand on some nights in the winter time. Um, being able to enforce a camping camping ordinance when there is a, a bed or a mat waiting for someone is a different scenario than what we've been operating in since the homeless resource centers opened. And in all of the cities, they have hard caps uh, that, that they all the cities that the resource centers exist in. So it's a different landscape of, of shelter availability, and that's why this confluence of of data people in the right positions and the ARPA funding coming together, it, it, this is a moment in time that I don't know that we've ever seen in the state of Utah in the capital city. And I'm grateful for the partnership and the recognition that this is a statewide humanitarian crisis and we intend to do something bold about that. On permanent supportive housing, how many units and how quickly? I know the coalition Wayne, do you want that? Or Lori? Sorry. I guess I would note that the Magnolia, which is beautiful, took years just to create the 65 units, so your thoughts on that? So essentially, we're looking at affordable housing as being the solution to all of these problems. And we're taking the approach where we're looking what we'd like to have built long term as well as short term. So as the mayor mentioned, in the short term, we're very much uh, looking for about 450 units to be built within the next one to two years. And there's some opportunities that um, dovetail with some of the funding that's coming into our community, uh, such as hotel purchases and rehabs, that would likely uh, accelerate the pace in which we can bring some of those uh, units online. So um, beyond the Magnolia, which will be filled up in the next two or three months with uh, 65 individuals or more, um, that will be receiving homes and uh, overnight or 24 7 supportive services. We would like another 450 in the short term and beyond that, thousands. If there are so many people that are shelter resistant, are you at all considering um, creating a shelter with a different set of rules, maybe a lower barrier to entry that might attract more people, or changing the existing rules um, of existing shelters? So the city doesn't own or operate or set those rules for any of the shelters. We are not interested in doing that. I don't think it's appropriate for a city to do that. 
Um, I don't know if Lori or, or Wayne want to take that on, but that's a, a, a question for other organizations. You want to? Uh, why, why would Wayne? you want to get involved? <clears throat> it, I think that uh, it, it's important to note that we have a governance infrastructure and the city is just part of the local continu continuum of care organization, which is the, what we call the coalition for short. And that is uh, an organization that is designated by HUD, so it includes all of Salt Lake County, and th they're responsible for what happens with homelessness in Salt Lake County. State Office of Homeless Services is here to support our continuum of care organization. Salt Lake County, Mountain Land, which includes Utah, Wasatch, and Summit County, and then what we call the Balance of State COC, which includes all the other counties in the state. And it's important to understand that because a lot of what is, is happening should happen at the COC level. And Salt Lake City should just be a partner in that. And so I know that the COC has, has come out with some plans. Uh, this is gonna be part of that plan. And, and, and we're gonna be here as a state to support it, like we're supporting it in Logan and in St. George, Ogden, and, and throughout the whole state, Moab, uh, which has been in the press recently. Actually, I believe it is appropriate. I've been to uh, Austin, they have a low barrier shelter, and I would call our shelters more medium barrier, and it's all about semantics, okay? Uh, some would call it a high barrier shelter. Uh, but that's at least my view of it when I compare it with other shelters, and having a low barrier shelter actually might be a solution, or probably not a complete solution, but could be part of uh, people that um, don't want to come into shelter, but want to be in a place that's warm or cool, or cool and, and get water or food. Uh, Haven of Hope in uh, San Antonio, uh, they have different levels of shelter, low barrier, high barrier, and then permanent supportive housing, uh, housing of course. And you know, the trend of the day is the, the motels that have um, been vacant during COVID and we have owners who want to sell, uh, they are a very good option to get beds quickly. And there, I think there's a lot of options for us to, to work on that uh, statewide, by the way, here in the coalition and uh, in Salt Lake Coalition and statewide. And, and I think we should be focusing at least on that be, for the near term. Those shelters, uh, they can be a shelter initially and turned in more permanent supportive housing, but having that stock available to us would be very, very important. Yeah. Uh, the question about different subpopulations and the needs are different. We know that we have a, a small population through COVID particularly that was clear they were medically needy. Um, whether age-related or underlying health conditions, we had specific rooms for them in hotels that worked very well. We know that we need a certain percentage of those in this 300 we're presenting, so that will be a part of it. There's a piece of it you're talking about with folks who probably need very, very low barrier entrance and exit in there. Um, that's also part of the current discussions for that 300. So yes, we're taking into account the subpopulations. The beauty perhaps, um, and maybe the challenge potentially long term, with motels and hotels is they do mean that they're within our system of beds, they're individual rooms, so they're more private, they have bathrooms, et cetera, which is a great thing. They're also uh, available now because of COVID at some points, and also because some of the funding that's being uh, made, public funding, is useful for acquisition of those. Long term, they could also be housing. So we know that if we keep building to shelter, we can keep adding shelter beds every year and every year and run into a situation where we have a lot of folks in shelter but not many going into housing. And we're never gonna get ahead of it that way. If we can use motels and hotels as emergency shelter as we did last winter, but keep them in the system, they can move to housing, which is ultimately the goal. And if we don't need to keep adding shelter beds, we can add housing, 
let's do that. So they're very flexible that way. I just want to I just want to clarify that when Andrew talks about we are talking about that within the 300, I believe you're speaking as a member of the coalition, not as Salt Lake City. Andrew represents the city on the, coal the Salt Lake Valley Coalition to End Homelessness. As a member, though, of the coalition, how many of the 300 beds have already been identified or do you still have to acquire all at this point? We're actively working on that as a coalition. Um, I take that as a zero. What happens is, um, for the past two years, we have ramped up in the summer and fall and then we've ramped down as you know in the late spring and summer again and what we're trying to do is make sure that this 300 bed scenario is something we can keep in the system for the foreseeable future until our community needs change so we're actively putting together projects and and just so you know the coalition makes recommendations and also um, puts together funding plans around uh, what this could look like, but ultimately the service providers in our community, which are nonprofits and um, also sometimes cities and municipalities, they're the ones that are actually going to be pushing forward these project plans because in our community, it's the nonprofits that own these uh, facilities. So for example, Shelter the Homeless, um, that I'm the executive director of, actually owns a thousand permanent shelter beds. It's the Homeless Resource Center system. And we're very happy to be partnering with Midvale City, South Salt Lake City, and Salt Lake City um, to have house these, these beds in Salt Lake County. So when we're talking about the flexible beds, we'd like to take the same approach and make sure that um, they're available for the foreseeable future. And there's a great partnership and collaboration amongst all the service providers, as well as the municipalities and state. Let me ask it this way, then. do you believe they can be found by December 1st? Absolutely, we're actively working on it. Just not ready to unveil any specifics. Thank you. So the targeted prioritized enforcement is until the 300 beds are available. Okay. When the 300 beds are available, we'll be able to more broadly enforce. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, wait, uh, we've got a clarification. Well, I just want to clarify. Thanks. When I talk about low barrier shelter uh, and the different models that are out there, uh, the state's not driving that. We're going to look to the local continuing care organizations in the balance of state We've split that up where we have Bear River, St. George have their own small organizing committee. So we're, we're there to support them. And, um, and, and the idea and the plan that's presented today, is, I think is a very positive direction from a state point of view. And uh, we're gonna do whatever we can to support uh, getting more housing on the ground. But that involves probably uh, getting with the legislature and persuading them and and I think that's part of the job and part of the reason why I'm in this position. Mayor, is the resource center model working? Because the logical assumption yeah. is the necessity of these steps is it's not, not as efficiently as we hope. It is working and, and an audit conducted by Wayne's office recently, you could, you could speak to it a little more clearly. In a nutshell I would say the resource center system is working very well the flow through to permanent supportive and transitional housing is not working as well. And that capacity, uh, that 450 that Laurie mentioned needing rather immediately in the next year or two is part of the solution to that. Do you want to add anything? Sure, I just, I, I think you know the process. When I was Senate president, we authorized an audit of the road home when it was uh, down at Rio Grande area. And there was a lot of challenges. Um, uh, it was a hard audit uh, for the service providers. And, and then we had a follow-up. The legislature, not me at this time, I wasn't in the legislature and authorized the follow-up, but it showed that things were working very well. And it became obvious to me, almost from uh, the first day I was in this position, that uh, the problem is not the, our shelter system. They're doing great, a, a great job, and I think that was any audit's gonna unveil a few little nuances. There were a few of those. But I think for the most part, it was, pray, it was a praise that the shelter system is working, or the resource center system is working well. It's on the other side. 
It's our, our treatment facilities, uh, treatment beds, it's housing opportunities. And if we don't have enough of that, it backs up in the shelters. And at least from my point of view, I think our shelters should be running, especially in the summer, at like 50, 60 percent of capacity so that we have capacity for an emergency or when winter comes on. And, and that's just my personal philosophy. Uh, but uh, that means you got to have what's after the resource center, and that's housing and treatment. All right, thanks for coming out here today.